When I say power, you probably think of a power outlet. But the fact is, batteries were used long before electrical grids or generators were in use. The term battery was first used in 1749 by Benjamin Franklin to describe a set of capacitors he'd wired in series in order to produce a higher voltage. He was using the word in the sense of a set of units connected together in series. But it eventually caught on so well that nowadays we use the term battery to describe even a single power cell. Of course, Franklin's capacitors are not batteries in the modern sense. We define a battery as a container consisting of one or more cells in which chemical energy is converted into electricity and used as a source of power. It would be another 11 years before someone used a chemical reaction to reliably produce electricity. In 1800, Alessandro Volta stacked copper and zinc discs on top of one another, separated by pieces of cloth soaked in salt water. He called this a voltaic pile, and it was the first source of relatively reliable continuous electricity in convenient pile form. And this is considered the first definitive battery. The zinc discs served as anodes, the copper as cathodes, and the salt water was an electrolyte. With these simple materials, we can easily create our own voltaic pile. Let's start by making a single voltaic cell in a beaker. The beaker cell produces 0 0.796 volts. Now I'll build a bunch of cells together as a voltaic pile using these cardboard squares, which have already been soaked in the salt water. It's not sturdy by any means, but this leaning tower of Volta produces enough power to light a 5mm blue LED. And for the record, that is 9 cells in the pile, producing 6.33 volts. Not long after the voltaic pile was created, William Cruikshank came along and improved the design by laying it on its side in a slotted box. This helped prevent the electrolyte from leaking and causing shorts between the plates, and it was known, appropriately enough, as a trough of battery. But moving away from piles and troughs, in 1836, John Frederick Daniel pushed the battery further with his Daniel cell. The Daniel cell's defining feature was its use of a porous barrier between two different electrolyte solutions. In this example, we see the copper cathode sitting inside of a porous earthenware pot filled with copper sulfate. This pot is then submerged inside of a container filled with zinc sulfate and encircled by the zinc anode. The porous earthenware allows ions to pass between the electrolytes, but hydrogen bubbles are prevented from forming. This greatly increased the cell's lifespan when compared to a voltaic pile. The Daniel cell wasn't perfect, but its improved reliability made it suitable for widespread use. In fact, the standard for one volt is based on the output of one Daniel cell. All of the batteries we've talked about up until now would be considered primary, which means once their chemical reactions are depleted, that's it, they need to be replaced. Now, a secondary battery can be recharged multiple times and used again without being replaced, which is a good thing. In 1859, French physicist Gaston Plante created the first rechargeable battery using a lead anode and a lead dioxide cathode immersed in sulfuric acid. 
The chemical reactions inside Plant's lead acid cell could be reversed by passing a reverse current through it. A pretty amazing feature, but its weight and size made it impractical for most uses. Still, it was suitable for some things. In fact, lead acid cells are still used in cars today. So far, all of these early batteries have used liquid electrolytes, which pose pretty obvious challenges to portability. But in 1886, Carl Gassner created the first dry cell battery using an electrolyte paste composed of ammonium chloride and plaster of Paris. Because it didn't spill and could be used in any orientation, the zinc carbon cell opened the gates to many new portable uses, such as flashlights. The zinc carbon cell would eventually be refined by the National Carbon Company and evolve into our modern alkaline battery. You can easily see how little the design has changed over the years, just a bit of help from a hacksaw. It's densely packed, but all the elements are still here. A carbon cathode down the center, a thin shell of zinc serving as the anode, and a thick pasty black electrolyte. Of course, more and more nowadays, when we think batteries, we think lithium. In fact, you probably carry around a lithium battery every day in your pocket. Because of its low density and high electrical potential, lithium has long been considered an ideal material for use in batteries. But it wasn't till the 1970s that the first primary lithium cells were made widely available. Further developments from researchers around the globe led to the release of the lithium ion battery in 1991 and later the lithium polymer battery in 1997. The major difference between lithium ion and lithium polymer is in the electrolyte. The microporous electrolyte used in lithium polymer batteries means they can deliver the same power as lithium ions, but in a lighter, flexible package. Otherwise, the chemistries are the same. Inside of a lithium ion cell, you'll find layers of anode, usually composed of carbon, cathode of metal oxide, and an electrolyte containing a lithium salt. So ultimately, batteries come down to chemistry. And although you'll hear about revolutionary changes being made to battery design, the basics remain the same. Anode, cathode, and electrolyte. If anything major changes, I'll let you know.